Hear with me the word of God. Esther chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Now when Mordecai learned all that had been done, and in particular he is... He has learned about the looming genocide of all of the Jews in the Persian Empire. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes. And he put on sackcloth and ashes. And he went out into the midst of the city. And he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province, whether the king's command, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hattash, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. Hattach went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the gate, king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king and to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hattach went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. When Esther spoke to, and then Esther spoke to Hattach and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law, to be put to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I've not been called to come into the king for these 30 days. And they told Mordecai what Esther said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come into the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go and gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I'll go to the king, though it is against the law, And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything that Esther had ordered him. This is the word of God. may be seated. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you have made your home in us. That you are Emmanuel, that you are the God who is with us. And I also thank you that you are the God who continues to speak even today through your word. And we ask now as we turn to this particular chapter in the book of Esther that you would work by your Holy Spirit to bring illumination. Help us to understand the meaning of this passage, but also we pray for the Spirit to apply this word to our minds, to our hearts, to our lives, um, that we would live all the more for the praise of your glory. We pray, Lord, in the midst of the different crises that are going on in this world and in our lives, perhaps even this morning, that you would show us how you would have us work through those crises. Um, Show us how to lament. Show us how to trust in you. And show us how to lay our lives down for you, even literally, if it's called for. So, Lord, help us to know how to respond, to live faithfully faithfully, 
to you in the midst of crisis. We ask in Christ's name, amen. This is a weighty passage. And over the last couple of weeks, I've been thinking about this particular passage, thinking about the crisis in this passage. Other crises have caught my attention in our world today. I was reminded, for example, of how many of our brothers and sisters in Christ are being severely persecuted around the world. In North Korea, for example, if you're a Christian discovered by the government, you may be forced into exile, or you may be executed, or work to death in horrific labor camps. In Eritrea, a country in East Africa, more than 1,000 Christians are in jail. Some of them pastors who have been locked up for over 10 years without charge. When a crisis strikes, how does God want us to respond as his church? A couple of weeks ago, as I read a book by Christian scholar Nancy Piercy, I had to put the book down again and again. I was just, just grieved. Um, startled by the horrific results in the West of the secular moral revolution. Um, I read heartbreaking stories of individuals who've concluded that they're females trapped in male bodies and have gone through the painful process of attempting to become women biologically. I've read about a Dutch right to die organization that drives euthanasia vans throughout Holland to provide legal drugs or injections to people who want to kill themselves. Imagine that. Euthanasia vans coming to your neighborhood. I read stories about the body parts of aborted babies discovered by police in wastebaskets. When a crisis strikes, how does God want us to respond as his church? Last week, I listened to a sermon preached by a man named Stephen Bray. Stephen is the lead pastor of Calvary Baptist Church, located in St. John's, Newfoundland, a city of 250,000 people, of which less than 2,000 are evangelical Christians. In his sermon, Stephen explained that his church has already planted two churches. It's in the process of planting a third and is hoping to plant more. I think the church is about the same size as ours. However, he also said that persecution has been intense. He explained that when they planted their second church in downtown St. John's, they were targeted by a group within the LGBT community over false allegations related to conversion therapy. And Stephen explained that as a church, they were almost driven out of everywhere. A local church they were renting kicked them out. And every other place they rented was threatened by people who said they would be boycotted or protested. Members of their own city council lobbied to get the church kicked out of a community center. And there was a a parade and protest in a local park with pictures of church members on plaques. And a lot of awful things were said about them. A church plant family with a one-year-old son and a five-year-old daughter was viciously targeted. On social media, a call circulated for someone to murder the entire family. It's insane. Teenagers within their church were Instagrammed and Snapchatted and told, do the world a favor and kill yourselves. When crisis strikes, how should God's people respond? Today, as we continue to move through the book of Esther, we find ourselves in chapter 4, in which two Jews, Esther and Mordecai, face a gigantic crisis. 
and they must decide quickly how they will respond. And if you're familiar with the story or if you, you've been following with us as we've been moving chapter by chapter through this book, then you'll remember that Esther is a Jew living nearly 500 years before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. She is an orphan who was raised in exile by her cousin Mordecai. And against all odds, she has become the next queen of a man named Xerxes or Ahasuerus, the king of the most powerful empire in her day. Probably you'll also remember that Mordecai, who served as a government official of the king, refused to bow down to Haman, the second most powerful man of the empire next to the king. And enraged by this, because of his arrogance, Haman underhandedly convinced the king to decree and schedule 11 months in advance the annihilation of not only Mordecai the Jew, but also all of the Jews throughout the entire empire. This decree is quickly communicated to virtually all of the citizens of the empire, including Mordecai. So we enter into this horrific scene. And I, if we have eyes to see, we see horrors around us that help us to empathize. And we get this if we think about it. But it also helps, I think, to imagine our Canadian government passing a bill mandating the execution of every Christian in Canada 11 months from this day, all because one Christian refused to respect the deputy prime minister. This is essentially the crisis Esther and Mordecai are facing. And this is where we pick up the story. The title of this sermon is When Crisis Strikes, and this message will have three main points. Each of these points will focus on how Esther and Mordecai respond to their own crisis. And my prayer is that as we enter into their world and observe how they respond to their crisis, the Lord will instruct us how we might respond to the crises in our own lives today and in our own world. I'm calling the first main point of this sermon lamenting when crisis strikes. We see this in verses 1 to 9 of chapter 4. Picking it up in verse 1, the author of this book writes this, When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and he put on sackcloth and ashes. And he went out into the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was a great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. So in the face of extreme crisis, what does Mordecai do? What do the Jews do? They lament. And notice how they lament, beginning with Mordecai. Immediately after hearing the news of the looming execution of all of the Jews in the Persian Empire, he laments outwardly. And what I mean is, overwhelmed with anguish, he literally tears his outer clothes. Utterly grieved, he puts on sackcloth, which is a coarse piece of clothing made probably of goat or camel hair, that is either a loose-fitting sack placed over the shoulders or just a loincloth. And full of sorrow, Mordecai heaps ashes over his head. Notice, too, that Mordecai laments loudly. At the end of verse 1, we're told he cries out with a loud and bitter cry. This grown man is wailing noisily. In addition to this, notice in verse 2 that he's lamenting publicly. He's at the entrance of the king's gate. Verse 6 tells us he's in the open square of the city. In front of the gate to the king's palace. He's wailing in the busy Persian hub of commerce and politics for all to see. 
And he's at the gate because evidently mourners are not welcome in the king's palace to express their complaints. And a complaint is precisely what brings Mordecai to the gate so that the king might notice him and be compelled to do justice. Notice too that Mordecai laments corporately. He cries in solidarity with the thousands of Jews scattered throughout the Persian Empire. And in addition to this, notice in verse 3 that Mordecai and the Jews lament with fasting. We're not told what kind of fasting this is. Probably involves abstaining completely from food with the exception of water. Aside from the Day of Atonement, the Lord did not command the Israelites to fast, though they could do so voluntarily for a number of different reasons. For example, at times the Old Testament saints fasted to humble themselves before the Lord and to acknowledge their total dependency on the Lord for physical and spiritual sustenance and life. Other times the Israelites fasted to express to the Lord their godly sorrow over their sin and their sincere turning away from that sin. Other times, saints fasted as a way of pleading with the Lord to avert some kind of disaster or danger. In the New Testament, nowhere does God command his church to fast, but on occasion we see the church doing it to express their hunger for Christ and their hunger to know his will and their hunger to do his will. In verse 3 of our chapter this morning, we're not told precisely why the Jews fast, but an educated guess is to express sorrow over their sin, to acknowledge to the Lord their total dependency upon him, and probably more than anything else, to cry out to the Lord for deliverance. So in the midst of a, a horrific crisis, Mordecai laments outwardly and loudly and publicly, corporately and presumably with fasting as the other Jews are doing. And Mordecai is not being strange or odd or unusual. This is the normal way Jews lament a tragedy or an, or an impending disaster in his day. And we can see this is typical by comparing Mordecai's behavior to other um, lamenting saints in the Bible. As an example, consider Job. Job, if you remember the story, lost virtually everything overnight, including all of his children. Chapter 1 of the book that bears his name tells us that upon hearing this tragic news, Job immediately tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. Then in chapter 2, we're told that Satan struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. His three friends decided to visit him to show him sympathy and comfort and were told that when they saw him, they did not even recognize him. And they raised their voices. And they wept. And they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven. And we're told that they sat with Job on the ground seven days and seven nights. And they didn't say anything. They didn't speak to him for those seven days and seven nights. And they didn't say anything because they saw that his suffering was great. Like Mordecai, Job and his friends lamented outwardly loudly, publicly, corporately. I'm not sure about you, but Mordecai, to be honest, he strikes me as melodramatic. I find the way that he laments exaggerated and over-emotional and even sensational. I mean, if you saw a grown man on his knees outside of the parliament buildings in Ottawa, weeping and wailing loudly for hours, perhaps days, over some kind of injustice in Canada, what would you make of it? 
Might you assume the man is sick? Or out of his mind? Spiritually immature or worse, spiritually lost? Like, dude, what's wrong with you? What I think is the sad truth of the matter is that probably we would tend to assume this when in reality, it's probably we who are out of touch with reality. And I say this because I don't think we know how to lament or lament well. At the beginning of this sermon, I mentioned various crises in our world, including abortion, euthanasia, gender dysphoria, persecution. How will we respond? Will we lament at all? And if we will not lament, then why? And if we do lament, then will we lament poorly? In contrast to Mordecai, will we lament inwardly and quietly alone in our own homes with no thought even of the value of prostrating ourselves before the living God with fasting? Dare I say that many within the church have lost the ability to lament well or even lament at all over the evil that pollutes this country and that corrupts our own hearts. If we're not lamenting at all, then it's because either we are ignorant of the horrific crises that surround us, or we suffer from lack of intimacy with our holy God who abhors evil and loves justice. Getting back to Esther 4, in verses 4 to 9, we learn that, shockingly, Queen Esther is ignorant of the crisis that is taking place in her own empire. She's oblivious. So in verse 4, having heard that Mordecai is at the gate in sackcloth and ashes, weeping and wailing loudly, she sends garments to him so that he might get dressed and stop lamenting and conceivably be fit to enter the palace and meet with Esther to tell her what's going on. But Mordecai will not stop lamenting. He would be a madman if he stopped lamenting at this time. A death sentence hangs over him and all the Jews, an unjust death sentence, and all because of the fact that he refused to bow down and pay homage to Haman. This is a time to lament, not to rejoice. So Esther sends her eunuch to Mordecai for an explanation. And you can see in verse 8 that Mordecai explains the crisis to the eunuch. And Mordecai urges the eunuch to command Esther, go to the king and beg for his favor and plead with him on behalf of your people, Esther. Plead with the king on behalf of the Jews. There's no time to waste here. This is an extremely urgent matter. The lives of countless women, children, And men are at stake. In verse 9, we're told that the eunuch delivers this message to Esther, which brings us to our second main point, which I'm calling trusting God when crisis strikes. We see this in verses 10 to 14. Beginning in verse 10, we see Esther's response to Mordecai's appeal, which will be delivered to Mordecai through her eunuch. Picking it up in verse 11, Esther replies to Mordecai by saying, essentially, everyone knows, including you, Mordecai, that if I go to the king uninvited and unannounced, I will be promptly executed. Unless he holds out his golden scepter towards me. At the end of verse 11, you can see why Esther is unsure the king would hold out his golden scepter to her. Were she she to approach him in the palace, especially uninvited and unannounced? The king, who is her husband, by the way, hasn't asked to see her for the past 30 days. 
I don't know what your marriage is like if you're married, but mine's not like this. That would indicate a problem. So as it turns out, all is not well in paradise. It seems that the king's affections for Esther have grown cold, or at least their relationship is not what it once was. In addition to this, we know that even in the best of times, this king is unpredictable, susceptible to making rash and foolish and tragic decisions because he is driven by pride and lust and greed and laziness. So the bottom line is this. Mordecai is urging Esther to go to the king to plead with him to save her people, but Esther believes the cost of going to the king might be her life, and she's not willing, at least not yet, to pay that cost to oppose injustice so that her people might be saved. In verse 12, We see that through her eunuch, Mordecai receives this message from Esther loud and clear. And beginning in verse 13, you can see what message he gives to the eunuch to take back to Esther. Picking it up there in verse 13, Mordecai says to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, about the injustice in your kingdom. Relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. There will be judgment if you keep silent. And Mordecai continues, and who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I'd say that's a pretty good response, wouldn't you? There's a lot we could unpack here, but I think it would be best for us to spend our time focused on how the same man whom we just saw lamenting fervently is the same man whom we now see trusting God deeply. That's important to catch. The same man whom we just saw lamenting fervently is now the same man whom we now see trusting God deeply. Do you see Mordecai's faith here in God? It's easy to miss, I think. Look at verse 14. Mordecai does not say, relief and deliverance may rise for the Jews. He does not say relief and deliverance will probably or likely or statistically rise for the Jews. No, he says relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews. They will be saved. If not through Esther, then some other agency will be the means. Well, Mordecai, well, how do you know this? Mordecai, why are you so convinced this will happen? Well, I think that Mordecai knows that the God of Israel never breaks his promises. God said to Adam and Eve, God said to Adam and Eve, you shall not eat of that tree, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And they did. God said to Moses at the burning bush, I will deliver my people out of the hand of the Egyptians, and I will bring them to a land flowing with milk and honey. And God did. Through his prophets of old, God said repeatedly to his people that in the promised land, I will judge you and I will send you into exile because of your hard hearts and your stiff necks. And God did. About 100 years before the reign of King Xerxes, God spoke through uh, the prophet Jeremiah saying this, when 70 years of exile are completed, I will visit you and I will fulfill my promise and I will bring you back to this place, meaning the promised land. And guess what? God did. In fact, 40 years before that moment, when Mordecai lamented at the king's gate, the second temple in Jerusalem had already been completed. completed. 
Through the prophet Jeremiah, God also said to his people, I will make a full end of all the nations among whom I have scattered you, but of you I will not make a full end. And verse 14, I think Mordecai knows this promise. And all the other promises. And Mordecai knows God will keep his promise. Like he's kept all of his other promises. So to be sure, Mordecai laments the crisis, but he also looks beyond the crisis to the God who is ever faithful. He looks to the God who is always providentially at work in his world to fulfill all of his word for the good of his people and for his glory. Not long before the beginning of the reign of King Xerxes, God said through the prophet Jeremiah, Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. Humble is he and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. God said it. And therefore God did it in the first century when the Lord Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem riding a donkey. Later, the Lord Jesus Christ said, destroy this temple, referring to his own body, and in three days I will raise it up again. And he did. He was crucified and he was resurrected on the third day. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. And he has, and he is. Look around you. The Lord Jesus Christ said, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. And those gates haven't. Jesus said, he will be with us until the end of the age as we go out into the world making and teaching disciples. And dearly beloved, I hope you can say in your hearts, he is with us. God says that when temptation comes, he is faithful to provide the way of escape. And he does. At the end of the book of Revelation, Jesus says, Behold, I'm coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. And he will. Whenever, dearly beloved, whenever a crisis befalls you, remember and latch onto and rest fully upon a promise of God. Trust that God will do all that he has promised. Trust God is ever faithful. Let's move to our third and final point, which I'm calling laying down your life when crisis strikes. We see this mainly in verses 15 to 17, but we also see it back in verse 14, which is the end of Mordecai's appeal to Esther. Mordecai trusts that God will save the Jews no matter what. He trusts that God will save the Jews no matter what because God promised not to annihilate his people. But Mordecai's faith in God's providence does not cause him to sit on his hands and do nothing. Nor does Mordecai advise Esther to sit on her hands and do nothing, waiting for God to do it all, work it all out apart from his people. Mordecai understands correctly that God oftentimes works through his people to keep his promises and accomplish his plan. So this is why Mordecai says to Esther, and who knows whether you, Esther, have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mordecai's point is that it could very well be the case that invisibly behind the scenes, God has been at work to ensure that Esther is now in the right place at the right time with the right standing in the Persian Empire to be used by God Almighty to save his people. There's something so wondrously encouraging about this. Um, We've seen in previous chapters that at times Esther sadly compromised her faith and did not obey the law of God. She was a broken sinner like us. 
but her broken past did not disqualify her completely from being used by God in big ways in the future. However, to be used by God in big ways in the immediate future, Esther now has to make a difficult decision. Faced with this gigantic crisis of the looming genocide of the Jews, Esther must decide if she will publicly identify herself as being with and for the God of Israel and his people, even if the cost of that allegiance might be her own execution. Either Esther will choose to save her own life, in which case she will lose it, as Mordecai has already pointed out, or Esther will choose to lose her own life, in which case she will ultimately save it. If the God of the Bible is real, and if the God of the Bible always keeps his promises, and if the God of the Bible in the end wins, then the better choice is obvious. But what will Esther do? The next time you're faced with a crisis, what will you choose to do? Will you choose to stand with and for God and with and for his people in opposition to the darkness of this world, even if it might cost you your life? You will. but only if you believe that God is real, that he always keeps his promises, and that in the end, God wins. In verses 15 to 17, you can see for yourself what Esther chooses. In this moment, she's a good example. She chooses to put everything on the line to serve and glorify God. She commands Mordecai to arrange for a corporate fast. And this is an absolute fast, no drinking, no eating, for three days. This is the kind of fast during which the Jews will cry out to God for deliverance through the mediatory work of Esther. And after the feast, after the fast, pardon me, Esther will go to the king even if it costs her her life. One of the things I find really striking about this chapter is how clearly it points to the mediatory work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see Jesus in this passage? Foreshadowed? The Bible teaches that God in heaven is the king who rules over all. And we all have rebelled against him and we've committed high treason against him. And the just sentence we deserve from this king of kings is death. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, God the king says this, the soul who sins shall die. And unlike Ahasuerus, this king of kings is just and always gives the punishment that is rightfully deserved. And because of our sinfulness and God's wrath, we cannot enter into God's presence uninvited or unannounced. And we cannot save ourselves. So what do we need then? A mediator. We need a mediator greater than Esther who can save us from God the King's decree of death. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, we're told that there is only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. Jesus is the mediator. He's the mediator who on the cross in our place suffered the wrath of God and died and who was buried and who was resurrected on the third day so that whoever repents of their sin and believes in him will not perish 
but receive the free gift of eternal life. Jesus is the greater mediator who, in fact, wasn't only willing to die, but who did die to bring us back to God. And who is now at the right hand of God in heaven, making intercession for us. Let's pray. Lord, there are so many crises going on in this world. You know it full well. You know all of it. And you know about the crises that are going on in our own lives, in our own homes. And I... And we together, we cry out for mercy and we pray, cry out for grace. And I think we would also do well to cry out for courage to see the crises, to acknowledge them, to let it in, to be broken over it, and to lament over the evil that's in our hearts and the evil that corrupts this land. So, Father, we ask, although I'm hesitant to ask this, that you would teach us to lament in the face of all this crisis, these crises going on. We also pray, Lord, that you would help us to trust you when we are faced with a crisis. To trust that you rule over all and that you are providentially at work, working at all things for our good and for your glory, always keeping your promises. And we ask, O oh God, in the face of crisis, to, that you would strengthen us to live for you with joy. Even as we lament, that we would lament with joyful hope. And we pray, strengthen us to live for the praise of your glory, serving you, no matter if it costs our own lives one day. And that we would say with Esther, if I perish, I perish, as I stand with God and in God and with his church. We thank you for Jesus, who saved us from the great crisis of our sin and the great crisis of your wrath, and who brought us into your presence. So now we can call you our Heavenly Father, and we can rest in your unchanging love for us, and um, give you thanks for the hope that we have, which is unshakable, that Christ will return soon and set everything right. We look forward to that day and pray, Jesus, come soon. In his name we pray, amen.